Check one, two, check, check, check. Sounds better. I'm trying to look at my Facebook page and everywhere. We're gonna go with this, folks. Let's see. Uh... All right. Hopefully that sounds better, folks. Hopefully uh, we're back and uh, better than ever, as they would say on a certain uh, radio program. Uh, you know, because I want to upload this to a uh, YouTube later and everything, uh, what we're going to do is replay some of the videos that I just got done showing. Appreciate everybody sticking around. Uh, we're going to talk about some pioneer cemeteries. Uh, had some horrible uh, audio difficulties here, and thanks to everybody who was on to tell me, Dean, your stuff sounds like absolute crap because uh, you are my producer. So, um, Let's see here. Uh, Arizona Street Media says it does sound better that he's back. He seems to be the only one that's back. So uh, we're going to head over and just throw one of these uh, real quick videos up here to see if anybody wants to come jump back on. But uh, please tell me uh, in the chat. We already got Arizona Street Media telling me it sounds better. Uh, please tell me if it sounds better, folks. Uh, but just for YouTube and Facebook, later on, for people who pop in, I am going to replay a couple of these videos to start this thing off. So I appreciate your patience, and thanks uh, for your support. Let's, uh, let's go hit this. But, but who, who killed Johnny Ringo? We have finally made it. This is a spot that I've wanted to come to for over two years. The Johnny Ringo grave site. Is there anybody out there? I think I need a lifeline. marker says the remains of this noted gunman and outlaw lie here a teamster traveling from west turkey creek found the body sitting in the fork of a nearby oak tree with a bullet hole in the right temple a coroner's jury reported the death to be suicide and ringo was buried on the spot there were others who viewed the body and maintained that the July 13th, 1882 death of Ringo was murder. We're gonna go down to the death cave, why not? Why not? In 1878, a group of Apache Raiders attacked a Navajo encampment near the Little Colorado River. Almost every Navajo man, woman, and child was killed in the raid. When the Navajo leaders got word of this attack, they sent out 25 men to avenge the fallen encampment. But unfortunately, the trail went cold. A few days later, they sent out another scouting team. The scouts had found nothing until they were startled by a blast of hot air that was coming from underneath the ground 
Upon further investigation, the scouts discovered that the hot air was coming from an Apache campfire in an underground cavern beneath them. They gathered up the dry sagebrush and driftwood on the canyon floor and started a fire at the entrance of the cave. Right. The Apache Death Cave, the Johnny Ringo grave site. Again, for those of you who have heard this before, I'm sorry, but we're going to do it again because this is the only one that's going to be uploaded. Not that nonsense I just put out a, a few minutes ago, but uh, I know my friend Kevin Halgan is going to be down. He's in going to be in Tombstone, so uh, that's why I threw on the Johnny Ringo grave site. I think it's one of uh, probably top five. Uh, historic grave sites that I've been to that people just want to know about. And it's because of the two major motion pictures uh, that were released in the early 1990s. Uh, that's really the only reason. Uh, when you read the life story of Johnny Ringo <laughs> and you watch the movies, you laugh. Uh, and when you read the life story of uh, Warren Earp and, I mean, uh, of uh, Wyatt Earp and Warren Earp and Virgil Earp and, and, um, all the Earp brothers, you laugh at uh, what is actually put out there. It's just not true, folks. But that's for another time. And I don't want to bust anybody's bubble about what Tombstone is all about. So um, let's uh, let's talk about a few of my favorite Pioneer Cemeteries. The one in Wilcox, Arizona, has Warren Baxter Earp. He's buried there. Uh, pretty cool site uh, to go and check out in Wilcox. And really all you have to type into the Google search is Warren Baxter Herb Gravesite, and it'll take you right there. Uh, really easy drive. And uh, if you look at it from above on Google Earth, it looks like a white beach because thousands of years ago, folks, that part of Arizona was underwater. I would love to know when it was underwater, how many thousands of years ago it was underwater. But uh, when you go to Wilcox, you'll notice that you're on a sandy white beach. It looks like you're in Daytona, Florida, and you're walking down the beach uh, there. It is uh, one of the most unreal uh, cemeteries that I've ever visited. It, movies need to be shot in the Wilcox City Cemetery. That's how cool it really is. You have these splintered off, 100-plus-year-old uh, tombstones made of wood. Uh, you have a lot of them that are broken to pieces on the ground that people have put together like in a puzzle so you can actually read who was buried there. You got the tumbleweeds, you know, rolling through the sand. You have the desert uh, plants and vegetation throughout that cemetery. Really an amazing spot. So if you have time to visit just one Pioneer Cemetery down in the uh, southern Arizona or southeastern Arizona, it would be the Wilcox City Cemetery. You won't be disappointed. And again, uh, born 1855, uh, Warren Baxter passed away 1900 in a shootout in the Wilcox um, Saloon. And uh, that, uh, that saloon is now a wine tasting room. So when you go there, uh, it's a wine tasting room. It's near, near the uh, Rex Allen uh, museum and the Rex Allen Museum is is definitely worth checking out. Rex Allen was from Wilcox, Arizona. One of the coolest things I saw in there was a signed uh, photograph of Elvis Presley to Rex Ryan uh, in uh, early 1970. Uh, the 1970 Elvis, uh, still looking good, Elvis. Uh, just uh, that that it would take you about an hour. It's a small museum. But it'll take you about an hour to get through. It's really, it's really quite amazing. And then right down at the end of the street is a new wine tasting bar. And uh, they have the plaque outside that said that is the location where Warren Baxter Earp was shot and killed in 1900. So uh, there's two. Let's, uh, let's go here to the graphics and make sure everything is still uploaded here like this is uh this is the johnny ringo grave site a lot of people have been out there checked it out said hey that fence looks awful new this is about two years ago so that fence has been up for at least two years now i think the owner was wise to put that fence up uh, another great thing there is off to your right that little pole looking like a small mailbox that is where you put your donation. And folks, I, if you have a quarter, a nickel, a dime, 
uh, some spare change, a 10, a 20 spot, put it in there uh, to help maintain the area. It must have cost them a lot of money to put this fence up. It's about 100 yards worth of fence there. And it keeps people off the back, off of the Turkey Creek area coming onto the property uh, when they really shouldn't be on the property. A lot of people are like, it sucks that the fence is up. Well, I believe the fence is up because they had a lot of trespassers. And when I say trespassers, yeah, that place is open to the public, but there is a huge sign. If you saw the video when you walked in, like from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. in the summertime, that's when they want people in and out. And you know you got a lot of crazies in there at 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock at night, and they're sneaking up from Turkey Creek uh, to come up to the Johnny Ringo site. And there's a house, if you're looking at this picture to the right, about 65, 70 yards away, there's a house. So... Um, I think the fence was a phenomenal idea. I'm glad that the owners did it. I'm glad that they still keep it open after all of these years. And uh, drop a donation in that little box there. They have a little rock on top of the box where you stick the change of the money into. I'm sure that it is greatly appreciated and it helps keep the site up because I'm sure it's not free to keep that site looking like it is. So the Johnny Ringo grave site, definitely worth checking out in Turkey Creek. And again, it's not hard to find. I get this all the time uh, on TikTok mostly. Where is this location? So awesome. Want to visit it. And I'm like, man, it's just a Google. It's just a uh, open up Google, type Johnny Ringo grave site, and it's going to take you right to it about 40 minutes from Tombstone, Arizona. Down the 191 is how we took it uh, through Pierce, Arizona. But right there, there's me and Johnny Ringo. And uh, we'll talk about Johnny Ringo at another site. Now, if you go a little bit further down the road, I say about another 30 minutes to the east uh, towards New Mexico, you're going to come to Fort Bowie. That's another great site. Uh, got a great historic cemetery back there. About a mile and a half walking path. Really easy. I had a bum knee, still do to this day, and had no issues walking up to uh, the cemetery. And one of the main reasons I wanted to hit that cemetery was for for this spot right here, uh, the gravesite of Lib Little Robe, the son of Geronimo, the Apache chief. Uh, he was buried there at Fort Bowie. Now, they uh, they really liked, if you read a lot about Fort Bowie back in the day, uh, they, had, they had captured uh, the Apaches, a lot of the women and the children and some of the men. Why Geronimo was out doing what, what he, you know, what he did best, you know, warring against everybody. And uh, they brought these guys back, Little Robe. Uh, it was actually, they were never supposed to be buried inside of like the military spot here on Fort Bowie. But uh, from everything I read, they loved Little Robe. Uh, they loved uh, him running around on the base and everything. So when he passed away, they buried him right there. So that's, uh, that's an awesome spot to go check out. If you ever get the chance to go out to Fort Bowie, they have the original stage stop, the Butterfield Overland stage stop that ran through there. Uh, before it was really Fort Bowie, but then when it was Fort Bowie, uh, they have the remnants um, of the fort a little bit farther back from the cemetery. You'll have to do that complete one and a half miles back to see that. Um, they have the original site of where the Apache Wars actually started. And uh, during the Bascom affair, Lieutenant Bascom, uh, him and Coach Ease had a fallout on that very area. About, I would say, uh, it's not far. It's a couple hundred yards from the grave site here uh, is where the Bascom Affair took place. And because of the Bascom Affair, you have this horrible war, uh, what we call the Apache Wars, that lasted a really long time. It was bloody uh, because of a young lieutenant who really didn't know what he was doing. He was trying to... Uh, you know, he, he wasn't he wasn't doing <laughs> what he was supposed to be doing. They sent the wrong man, I think. But uh, that site is really historic. So if you ever get down to Fort Bowie, stop, take the mile and a half in, and then mile and a half back out. So what, three mile round trip? Really, really an awesome site. And then the the, the son of Geronimo Little Robe is buried in the back of that cemetery with a lot of other people. But uh, this is really the only picture I took while I was there. Let's uh, roll over here. A uh, lot of cemeteries called the Pinal Cemetery. A lot of them. And uh, this one is located in Claypool, Arizona. So just outside of Globe. Globe and Claypool just butt up against each other. You go through Miami. 
then you have to go through Claypool, and then you go through Globe. And you get to, I call him, and I'll, I mispronounce it, I'll, I'll say it, I do not have the pronunciation correct, but it's Chief, I call him Tokalia, uh, my uh, Native American friends who uh, come to TikTok, some nice, some not, just like everyone else, uh, uh, tell me exactly how to pronounce it, but it's Chief Tokalia, this grave site. Uh, if you look at, uh, I don't have a closer picture, but this guy lived well over I think it's about 115 years, according to the grave. Now, the people that were at the Pinal Cemetery in Claypool, when I was looking for this, uh, there was a gentleman with his son rebuilding the fence around the cemetery. And uh, he actually helped locate this because it was on a hill. And he said the reason it looks so good and the tombstone and everything looks so nice still uh, where it's at in the cemetery is that there are Native Americans to this day that visit that grave once a month uh, to keep it up and to keep it nice. And he was uh, he was on the San Carlos Indian Reservation uh, back in uh, 1874 when uh, the Indian agent John Clum, who had become the first mayor, first elected mayor of Tombstone in 1881, um, he uh, John Clum was over the San Carlos Indian Reservation and Chief Takalia was one of his first five Apache police force that John Clum put together. John Clum ran uh, the reservation different than most uh, Indian agents ran the uh, the uh, reservations back in the uh, early 1870s. He believed that they should uh, uh, look after each other, and uh, he formed a, an Apache police force that went out and did the arrest if if people did you know if they if they got off the reservation or if they were making illegal moonshine on the reservation uh if, if they were doing something wrong he would send them out um when they brought him to a courtroom he served as like john roberts the supreme court justice chief supreme court justice was john clum but then he brought in uh, the Apaches on the reservation to sit uh, for the trial. They made the final decision on whether they were guilty or not guilty after hearing the hearing. It was just laid out like, you know, our Constitution is how John Clum was doing it. But this is the grave of Chief Takalia. He lived a long life. He was a friend of John Clum. John Clum met him when he was in his 90s, I believe, uh, for the last time. And what's cool about Chief Takalia is. In 1877, John Clum led 100 of his Apache police force for 400 miles. Why did they do this? Well, they had a meeting with uh, Geronimo, and uh, they split up along the way. And uh, John Clum had like 12 of his Apache police force with him, so 13 individuals. And Geronimo saw them coming the night before and said, well, he's only got 13 individuals, this white guy. Uh, we're, we're not afraid of him. We're going to meet up. So they meet up in this compound in 1877. And uh, John Clum comes face to face with Geronimo. You can read this all in uh, Apache Agent. Uh, you can get that book. Uh, it's all about John Clum from 1874 to 1877 being at the head of the San Carlos Indian Reservation. And uh, he meets him. He tells Geronimo that he needs to surrender. Geronimo looks at him like he's going to take him out. He's got a rifle in his hand. Uh, his warriors are all around him. And then outstep another 80-plus uh, Apaches from the San Carlos Reservation with their weapons pointed directly at Geronimo. He surrenders. So John Clum does something that the United States Army for years couldn't do, and that was capture Geronimo. So a lot of people say Geronimo surrendered. He did. At the end, Geronimo did surrender. But uh, he was captured once, and that was in 1877 by John Clum and his 100 Apache police force. And they marched him 400 miles back in shackles uh, back to the reservation and locked him up. And the sad thing is that John Clum had a falling out after three years of being over the reservation. And when he left... Um, to go to, a, to to another town that we'll talk about later. When he left, uh, they still had Geronimo, you know, uh, held up in, inside of a jail, and then they let him out, which was the dumbest thing, and it led to years, 10-plus more years of raids and stuff with Geronimo and his Apaches. But uh, 
that is the gravesite of Chief Takalia. Uh, really, really a cool spot. And again, the Native Americans who take care of this site for so long are there, according to the people that we met, to take care of the cemetery at least once a month to take care of that gravesite. That's why it still looks go- so good. And you see that uh, they have two American flags on that gravesite there. So that's interesting uh, in the world that we live in and the preconceptions that we have that uh, the Native Americans that keep it up have two American flags there. Pretty interesting. Um, let's move on. Let's move on. Uh, is this the next one? Yeah, this is a cool one. A lot, some people know about this. Some people don't. In the Mesa Cemetery in Mesa, Arizona, right across the street from where the Oakland Athletic Stadium is. Uh, when you go in there, that is the uh, gravesite of Waylon Jennings, the famous country singing star Waylon Jennings. Um, I didn't know this. Uh, it took me about a year and a half uh, when I got here to to realize that Waylon Jennings was buried in this city and in, in this cemetery in Mesa, and it's just you know all the all the um, uh, tombstones and stuff are flat like that, and you can see his. It's a different color. There's a picture of him on it. It's way more detailed than the other stones that are around there. But uh, his wife's family are all from Mesa, Arizona. So a lot of people ask, why is Waylon Jennings buried in Mesa and not in the great state of Texas? Well, this is why. His family was out here. He passed away out here, and he's buried in the Mesa Cemetery. And uh, when you go there, this is why it's not hard to find. You look throughout the cemetery, even if you don't know uh, what plot or section he's in. You just look for the flowers, um, and then you look for the Jack Daniels bottles, the whiskey bottles, the beer bottles, and the American flags. And uh, you'll spot it really easy. And the day I was there, that's what it looked like. And uh, they say over there that uh, it's every 24 hours they got to take the stuff off of there. And the gentleman that was taking care of the place said that every now and then a guy comes, sits down with the guitar, and they sing sing for an hour, and then they leave. And then they come back, and it's somebody new. And they sing for like two hours, and then they leave. So uh, there is the gravesite of Waylon Jennings. Again, a crate across the street from the Oakland Athletics Stadium in Mesa, Arizona, the Mesa City Cemetery. And before we go any further, let's uh, jump over to the chat and see if anybody else is up in here. Allergies are taking me out. I like this here. I like when it says, sounds perfect while smooth. I appreciate that. Brian uh, was at foe. Just got the alert. Much better now. Uh, Scott's Hello to Scott. Uh, if he's asking what cemetery, if we were looking at the Chief Takalia, that's the Pin, uh, Pinal Cemetery. There's a lot of those uh, in the state. That was in Claypool. This one here is the Mesa City Cemetery right across again from the Oakland Athletics. Not their training facility, but their stadium that's a little bit farther down from their training facility. All right. Let's go back over here. Let's pop this music on while I try to find something else, guys. So before we go on any further, I want to show you something that I invested in, and it's already working. Uh, We went ahead and wrapped. Uh, I have a Jeep Gladiator that we got about six months ago. Uh, We saved up to wrap the Jeep uh, to get the word out, and it really does the job. I was just at the mall the other day, and somebody spotted me and said, hey, man, your, your TikTok is dope. Uh, it was a, a two younger gentlemen, and uh, I really appreciated that. Uh, going through the uh, was recognized driving through the Santan Mall yesterday uh, over in Florence today. So it's doing its great job. But I want to show you these pictures and ask you what you all think. And uh, if you spotted this, would you recognize the Arizona Timeless Tour? So let me let me show you a couple pictures of uh, this Jeep. This is the back of the Jeep. 
Uh, that is the email. Uh, the official Arizona Timeless Tourist email is the AZTT at AZTT.org. And just, uh, just write in the email. That's where you schedule tours. Right to the right there is the QR code for our chip. So anybody can be sitting in their car and uh, turn their camera on, hit that uh, QR code, and it will pop up. Uh, the 169,000 uh, followers we have on TikTok, plus the over 70 million views we got on TikTok. So that's what the back looks like. Uh, this is one side right here. See that beautiful face on the back of that thing? And, and I've I tried to pick out the best pictures that would come out on here. So, you know, you got my ugly mug there. You got another QR code up there. And then you got the Titan II missile at the Missile Museum, about, what, 20 miles south on the Interstate 19 of Tucson. And then one of my favorite places in the middle across where it says Arizona Timeless Tourist, you have the, uh, the um, uh, from the Cold War, the Corona spy satellite targets out in Casa Grande. Uh, that I love that. And then up in the front is when I'm out in Agua Fria National Monument, another great place. And then uh, this is the other side of it, another big, you know, fat face there. Uh, that big middle picture. A lot of people can't tell what that is, but that is up on Post and Butte, where Charles de Brill Post and is buried outside of Florence, Arizona, who they call the father of Arizona. And, uh, yeah, some, some other things up on there, but, uh, those are the pictures. Hopefully this thing grabs the attention and it really looks like it definitely grabs attention when I've, uh, have for now 48 hours and, uh, it's doing really good. So I wonder what you, what you all think about the new wrapped Jeep. Let's go in the chat and see if anybody has anything to say here. Yes. Love the new wrap. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you know, it took a, it took a minute for the save up for it, but I think they, they have this little thing on, uh, you know, uh, advertising and they say, if you drive that thing for an hour a day, you get 3000 eyes on that thing. That's a minimum of 3000 people looking at that, uh, Gmail and all that other stuff. So hopefully we get more tours scheduled by driving around that uh, that Jeep. I used to work for the San Carlos Apache Reservation. Interesting, Scott. One day I have not gotten down there. I've been close to it, but I have not gotten down to it. Uh, great rap. Thank you. Thank you. All right. All right, let's head back up here to the captions, uh, to the graphics here, and go to another spot. Hey, just really quick, why I chose those those locations on the Jeep? Here is the here is Post and Butte. Uh, it's a, it's a, lo a little bit more difficult uh, uh, to to recognize it on there, but this is a real significant place. Charles de Brill Post and buried on top of Post and Butte outside of Florence, Arizona, on Hunt Highway. This guy was known as the father of Arizona, and there's a big reason why. He's the one that went to Washington, D.C. in 1862 and lobbied Congress and President Abraham Lincoln to have Arizona become a separate territory, which it did, I believe, 24 February 1863. So because of Charles de Brill Post and a few other guys, that happened. So he was reburied. He was reinterred on top of Post and Butte. A um, hundred years after he was born, he died in 1902 and was buried in downtown Phoenix. Body re -ex uh, exhumed from uh, his grave in downtown Phoenix in 1925 to celebrate his hundred year birthday. This uh, pyramid was placed up at the top by his good friend, Governor Hunt, and about a thousand people were at the ceremony in 1925. So I chose that. And then I chose this, this Titan the Titan II missile at the Titan Missile Museum that was taken with my cell phone because it was so bright and I just stuck it down over the glass because I couldn't see down in there. And that's the picture that came out. I love that place. So it did that. And then uh, I put this on there is, is one of my top five places, the uh, Cronus Spy Satellite Target. Uh, it's really a calibration target. 272 of these placed from 1960 to 1967 across the desert in Casa Grande. And uh, that's me in the middle down there. We flew a drone over that one. That one's in superb uh, condition. But uh, yeah. All right. So what grave site are we at now? 
This one is in that cemetery where Charles de Brill Poston was buried in 1902 uh, in the uh, Pioneer and Military Memorial Park. If Kevin Helgen's still on here, he's been there with me before. I think that he might have been there when I took this exact picture a couple of years ago. But um, this is in the same cemetery in the back. This is the Lost Dutchman. He's known as the Lost Dutchman. That's how most people know who he is, not by his real name. But his real name is Jacob Waltz, born in Germany, came over to the United States, and uh, he passed away in uh, 1891. And since then, everybody has gone up. 7,000 people annually go into the Superstition Mountains to look for that lost Dutchman gold because of this guy right here. He's, you know, it, it could be kept up better. It's in the corner back in that uh, in that lot. And I do understand, you know, it's been there since 1891, but uh, you think they do a, just a tad bit better job. But uh, the cemetery is open from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. on Thursdays only. That's the problem, folks. 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Thursdays only. Um, and you're at the military, uh, the Pioneer and Military Memorial Park. It's like seven separate cemeteries under one umbrella now, around 1950-something. It was in such a disarray. Um, that they, uh, the city of Phoenix came in and started cleaning it up. And they've done an extraordinary job of cleaning it up. I mean, all your major pioneers um, from Phoenix and around the Southwest, there's quite a few of them, folks, that are buried. This is one of the most famous graves in there, Jacob Wolf's The Lost Dutchman. But uh, you have... Um, you have quite a few, uh, quite a few guys buried in there. A lot of uh, like secret society places in there. You got a lot of Mason uh, sections of the uh, of the graveyard. But uh, if you ever get a chance on a Thursday from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. to check out the Pioneer Military Memorial Park, you will not be disappointed. Go check it out. Uh, there will be volunteers there. And uh, if you want what you need to get, if you've only been there one time, I do do tours there that you can book through the AZTT at the AZTT.org um, email site. Uh, they'll give you a little brochure and you can hunt down some of the more famous uh, people that are that are buried out there. This is, we talked about this earlier. This is the grave of Warren Baxter Herb, 1855 to 1900. The youngest brother of uh, of Wyatt Earp and the youngest brother in of four in the family, he's buried there in the Wilcox City Cemetery back there in the back. Uh, pretty cool. You know, obviously, they redid the the grave. Um, you know, it's not wood anymore; it's this piece of metal, and it's actually a little bit gaudy. They should have made it a little bit smaller, but they didn't. But you can spot it. But it is all the way back in the back of the cemetery. Warren Baxter, the only Earp brother buried in the great state of Arizona. Let's see here. Next, we're jumping over to the historic Pierce Cemetery in Pierce, Arizona, which is a ghost town now of like 12, I don't know, maybe it's not maybe eight people. Uh look, if you get the chance, if you're down in Tombstone, this ain't but about a 25-minute drive, depending on the road that you take. Uh, from Tombstone to there, 25, 30 minutes at the most. I'd say 25 minutes. Um, it's got the little ghost town there, a uh, little store, the old post office. You, you, if you drive in the back and you don't want to get lost or anything, but uh, there's some more stuff back there. But the cemetery is really pretty awesome. And uh, the one reason that I went to the cemetery is right for this gravesite right here. Sergeant George H. Platt, October 1832 to August 1906, member of the Union Light Guard, 7th Independent Company, Ohio Volunteer Calvary, was established to serve as bodyguards and mounted escorts for President Abraham Lincoln. This is the first, the first like secret service happens. Um, uh, back in, uh, I believe it's 1862 or 63, they get there. And it's all from the great state of Ohio. That's where I was born and raised, in the great northern Ohio, and um, right up around Cleveland. And uh, they picked out, I believe, 100 guys 
uh, the best of the best that they could find. And they were bodyguards and mounted escorts for the president. There is an actual book that's like 17 pages long that you can get free on the internet that a gentleman wrote about what it was like. Now, when I do put this out and it gets about 100 to 150,000 views on TikTok, uh, each of the three times I've put it out there in the last year and a half, people are like, well, I guess they didn't do their job. It was not their job to guard the president of the United States at that night at the Ford Theater. It was a police officer's job to guard him. So, uh, you know, a lot of people don't know their history. That's why I do uh, these lives. That's why I do TikTok. That's why I do YouTube and Instagram and Facebook. But uh, it wasn't. It wasn't the seventh independent company, Ohio Volunteer Calvary, uh, which was called the Union Light Guard. It wasn't their job to keep President Lincoln uh, safe during his visit to Ford's Theater. Unfortunately, they should have been. But it was a local police officer that was in charge of him. But uh, this guy's buried in the Pierce Cemetery. And, you know, it's really cool is this is a relatively new stone they put out there. It's probably about three years old. Uh, I don't have the picture of the original stone that's right behind it, unfortunately. Uh, I just didn't upload it uh, for you guys to see. Bad on me. But uh, somebody was going through this graveyard and and saw that this guy, it said on the, on the stone, I believe it just said, the 7th Independent Company of Ohio Volunteer Calvary. And uh, they went ahead and looked it up and everything. And you can see the thing was placed there in 2017. So five years ago, that stone was placed in front of the original headstone. Uh, they did the information that sounded familiar to them, or this guy would just, it would just go off in the history of not understanding who he was. But he was one of the first hundred people that really formed the Secret Service at his, you know, in his, his, his birth time. Um, they, they set up tents. And I'll, I'll tell you what, reading the book, a lot of them were not really happy that this was their job. They wanted to be with their brothers, their fathers, their uncles, uh, fighting on the front lines of the Civil War in these battles. And they weren't seeing any of that there. And uh, what they were doing is just watching the president walk from the White House to, um, uh, to the uh, war room and stuff like that, which was only about 75 yards away from the White House at the time. And then he would go back. Then he would mount up on his horse to ride somewhere, and somebody, two guys would mount up with him and follow him. But uh, really a cool spot there in the uh, historic Pierce Cemetery in Pierce, Arizona, which is a ghost town now. This thing is out there in the middle of no man's land. They got huge snake signs around there. You do need to watch out for the snakes, the rattlesnakes out at this cemetery, because you are all by yourself, folks. So this is the grave of George H. Platt. Really cool uh, piece of history right there. All right. By just putting this up here and just waiting for the comments, whose grave site is this? Anybody know whose grave site this is? Let me uh, let me pull up the chat here really quick because I'm. Scott says I worked at the Apache Sky Casino, and no, I'm not a native. Uh, how can I email you? Yeah, you can email me at that new email. It's the uh, A Z T T. Um, at the AZTT, because you have to have it before and after to do the .org. So it's the AZTT at the AZTT.org. Or you can email me at DeanB7010 at gmail.com. And uh, you can get a hold of me any of those two ways. Uh, a, a, doo -doo -doo -doo. Here we go. Um, Arizona Street Media. Uh, let's see here. I used to work a lot in Tombstone and have been to Pierce many times. So, Scott, what is this picture of? Let me, I, I haven't gone down. Oh, yep, I see that uh, Christine Stewart has joined. Uh, good evening, Christine. Uh, Brian is again in here. Let's see here. Secret Service was originally to protect the U.S. currency. Let's see here. Tombstone, Shefflin. Yeah, that's it. Ed Shefflin. I think it's the right way to say his last name, Shefflin. Um yeah, this is a cool spot that a lot of people miss going to uh, uh, Catherine Payne. Good to see you. Um, I have not been on for a while. They billed me again. And when I see that I'm wasting this money and I haven't been on in like 32 days, I'm like, I better just go on. So we're on for a late. This is past my bedtime. I'm an old man. 
But uh, Ed Shefflin gravesite, this is a cool spot. This is, uh, you know, Ed Shefflin died in Oregon. He was searching for gold in Oregon. And uh, when he passed, he was buried in Oregon. And uh, his brother was with him. And uh, there's Jewel Weekend Road Tripper. Good to see you. Um, so when he was buried in Oregon, that's quite a ways from Tombstone. Uh, his brother read his will. And his will said that he wanted to be buried uh, on a hillside outside of Tombstone, Arizona, the town that he made famous, the town that he named, and uh, with a buried in his um, his custom uh, uh, prospecting uniform in a prospecting grave. So I guess this was like a, a prospecting marker, is what it looked like back in the day. So you know, his brother got him back out, put him in a wagon. And they came all the way across to, to don't even imagine what that trip was like to Tombstone to bury him right there. And it's a beautiful view. You're looking, you're is in, the, in the exact location that he wanted to be buried at overlooking uh, the historic downtown Tombstone, Arizona. Now it looks nothing like it used to look, but that's a cool grave site right there of Ed Shefflin. Uh, you know, before Ed Shefflin, before striking it uh, rich out there, with those mines that he found, you know, and be it was called Gooseneck. Joe B, how's it going, Joe B? Um, so do you think that that Tombstone would be this big deal if it was still called Gooseneck? So, it, you know, Ed Shefflin, he he decided to call it Tombstone, and there's a lot of reasons why, and a lot of people are credited with him, you know, going out in that area trying to find, you know, gold. And then people telling him, the only thing you're going to find is your tombstone. I think it was the great, uh, and and we're going to look up this guy's grave site in just a minute, uh, Al Seaver, the great uh, uh, Indian scout uh, during the Apache Wars that said it to him, but uh, nothing really can be nailed down at that. But if you're going to Tombstone, don't miss the grave of Ed Shefflin. And that's the reason Tombstone's there. Uh, That's the reason Tombstone came to be. That's why we got the 90s movies and all these cowboys and 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 crazy people that were in tombstone and that's why we're so excited about it is this guy right here so uh check out the grave sites really interesting uh there's joe b joe b's a good guy there's joe b um it's good to see christine on here and her sister good to see you uh let's go to the next one really quick here captions we'll go over to back over to the graphics here we're flying through these bad boys uh this here is the grave of high jolly uh when they started the camel corps to uh to to survey a road to really survey the railroad uh up across uh northern arizona they uh, sent in all these camels. That story is is pretty unbelievable, actually. How many years later that people saw camels, ro- uh, you know, roaming free in the Arizona desert? Now, some of those stories are are crazy to think that the camels would live that long, but uh, a lot of crazy stories. But uh, had to make it out to Quartzsite, Arizona, to check out the grave of High Jolly, uh, who was the camel herder, head of the camels during the uh, expedition, really cool grave graveyard there. Uh, Quartzsite is a very interesting place. I'm trying to look through these things and see if I took off, and I think I did. Let's see. I'm looking through the pictures, and I think because I had too many pictures loaded up on the software here that I took it off, and I did. So we won't even talk about it. But uh, that is the grave of High Jolly, the great camel herder during. Uh, uh, the time when they were laying out, I can't remember the parallel that they were with, uh, that they were laying out, but, uh, pretty cool gravesite right there. And because I did not see Jewel on here or Christine on here, I just wanted to show you guys the new wrap to the Jeep really quick. I just showed it to everybody else. This is the back of the new Jeep. That is the new email. If you want to get a hold of me, A-Z-T-T at the azt.org and then send me the email uh there's a qr code on there that people can hit uh that's the one side this is the other side 
right there. And then this is the other side right there. Took me a long time to save up for this wrap. It took them 11 days to put this wrap on. And uh, I'm really happy with it. In the last two days, we've gotten a lot of uh, people. I was uh, saying earlier, I pulled up in front of a pizza place in, in Santan, uh, the Santan Mall in Gilbert. And somebody says, man, your TikTok is dope. And when I got out, a younger group. So that was cool. Was recognized in Santan Mall driving through there. So uh, trying to get the word out, trying to get the tours out. So I was all day up in Florence today, driving around and talking to some people. Uh, but that's that. Let's go to the chat. Bum, 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 bum. Thanks, Joe B. Joe B. So you'll be able to spot me. I come through Santan all the time. I was in. I was up uh, uh, up there uh, to do. Thank you. Uh, it took a minute to to save up for that thing, and I'm. I'm flabbergasted how it turned out. When you do a computer rendition of something, and I give all credit to my wife because she really, really designed most of that, did a lot of the online stuff with it. But they did a fantastic job putting the wrap on. It took longer than expected. Some hiccups along the way. Something that should have took four and a half days took 11 days. But uh, yeah, it seems like it's going to work out uh, work out well. Um, choo -choo -choo. All right, so let's get back. Put this up there really quick. Get back to the graphics and um, see what we haven't talked about yet. Uh, yes, one of, uh, I've said this before, one of the, I think the best, I shouldn't say one of the, the best Pioneer Cemetery in the state has 159,000 burials. That's because it's active today, and uh, there was a. Um, I, I'm planning on making it down in a couple of days to Tucson. Um, there was a, a burial spot down there in uh, which they moved all the people around 1906, 1907 time frame to that cemetery. Also, some major players in Tombstone in the Southwest. A lot of people were moved into that cemetery. It's got over 159,000 burials. Um, and that is the Evergreen Cemetery in Tucson. There's not one better. There is not one better. Unfortunately, do I want to say it? I think, yeah, the folks that work there, I understand you've got some really famous people buried in there, and uh, they really don't want to tell you anything. They'll give you a map, but the map has nothing on it. It's just unless you know where they're, where these people are buried, I've spent hours in their GPSing and, and checking out the graves there. And I've talked to the front office twice and it's uh it's a no go to get uh, locations of individuals, but um, the evergreen cemetery, man, if you got people coming from out of town, we're going to start doing tours in there once a month. Uh, let's, let's see here. Let's go this right here. Now, most of you won't know who it is, Thomas J. Jeffords. Most of you won't know what it is, but if you read it right there, it says, uh, friend and blood brother of Cochise, peacemaker uh, with hostile Apaches in 1872. Um, this monument was placed, uh, there was a huge newspaper article back in 1964 when they placed this uh, marker, the daughters of the American colonists. And uh, he was considered, and you know, there's been a lot more burials in there since 1964, but it was still like 140, 150,000 people. His grave was considered the most famous grave in that cemetery, Thomas J. Jeffords. And he was an unbelievable friend of Chief Apache Chief Co. Cheese. And uh, he was actually at, he was such a, close companion of Cochise that Cochise knew that at the end of his life that uh, his his group of Apaches were going to have to go to a reservation to, to be able to live they were going to have to and his request was that Thomas Jeffords would be the Indian agent over the San Carlos reservation at, at, at that time so he was really close and nobody else 
when when these guys are buried, there is no white man or anybody outside of that tribe going to be at the going to be present at the burial of a chief or any other Native American back then. And Cochise was invited. Cochise was there to see the ceremony of the burial of Cochise, which is really and truly unbelievable. That's why it says friend and blood brother of Cochise on it. And uh, he was there. He knew and he never said till the day that he died and was buried in this plot where Cochise was buried. And you know it was asked a, a million times in his lifetime. He is giving he, much credit is given to him for ending the Apache Wars because they wanted to have a one on one. The new commander wanted to have a one on one with Cochise, but there's no way to get that one on one or get to that that message uh, to Cochise. So they went to Thomas Jeffords, and Thomas Jeffords set up the meeting with the new commander, the army commander, with Cochise and his warriors to start ending the Apache Wars. But uh, this gravesite, if you go in, it's right on top of Oracle Road. I mean, it's like in the first couple of rows. It took me a long time to find it. it the GPS, I think it was meant to throw you off. Uh, but uh, it took me about an hour. And the great thing is somebody took this picture and they, the picture was tilted up. And so I tried to match the picture with the trees. Well, there's about 10,000 trees in the cemetery. But uh, 60 minutes later, I found the gravesite of who they say is the most famous person buried in this cemetery. And that's saying a lot for as many burials as, that are in there. And who's buried in there? Thomas J. Jeffords. Really a cool, cool spot. Now, do, 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 do. I don't think I put the other gentleman. Now, let me bring this down really quick. The cool thing there, folks, is right, mm, I don't know, 100 yards from him is the gravesite. I don't have it on here, of William Breckenridge. Uh, William Breckenridge, the deputy sheriff of Tombstone, Arizona, the new Cochise County, Arizona, Back in the days of the shootout at the OK Corral, back when we all, uh, you know, of the the Johnny Ringos, of the uh, Bill Brocious, of the, all of the people that uh, we make Tombstone so famous for, well, William Breckenridge is just buried a hundred yards to the left of uh, Thomas Jeffords in that cemetery. His part, his his part was played poorly by Jason Priestley, and not that Jason Priestley played a poor. Uh, role that he was told to pr play, but uh, that is not how William Breckenridge held himself. Believe me, read the books. He wrote a book. Uh, read what people talk about William Breckenridge. William Breckenridge also was the last known person, known person to see Johnny Ringo alive. He came across him. Uh, uh, they were going past uh, from Gaileyville, and that's where uh, Johnny Ringo was heading. Uh, when he saw William Breckenridge and his in his book, he details the whole thing. But uh, William Breckenridge, the last person to see Johnny Ringo alive before a few days later, a uh, teamster who was hauling wood found his body uh, up against an oak tree. And is where it is today. Uh, we checked out that gravesite at the very beginning of of this uh, of this live show. But uh, he's in there. And then we have uh, let's see here if I've got anybody else. Um, Charles Scheibel, uh, unfortunately I don't have a picture of him. He's buried in there. Charles Scheibel was, uh, one of the very first, uh, sheriffs down in that area of Tombstone. And he is credited with, uh, uh, deputizing his good friend, Wyatt Earp. Uh, that's where Charles Scheibel comes in. Uh, the first time a Wyatt Earp is deputized in the state of Arizona is by Shy Bell, uh, who is the sheriff of the area at the time. And a lot of people, you know, are are thinking that uh, he was deputized before that, but uh, that would be Virgil Earp, who was uh, more of a lawman than Wyatt Earp ever was. If you think about Wyatt Earp, Wyatt Earp wasn't a lawman more than uh, five years of his life. And he was a lawman for about 12 months at a time. And when he wasn't a lawman, which was uh, a lot more time than when he was, he was doing some things that uh, were on the opposite side of the law. But that's for another time. But uh, Charles Shy Bell is buried in there. 
Let's see what else we got here. Then there is a cemetery that's right next to this one that's got these almost 160,000 burials. There's a Catholic cemetery to right on the other side. There's a fence that separates it. And if you go over there, there is this grave site. And I know you're just going to see my big ugly mug in the picture and not know, can't see the thing because I didn't realize that that was the picture I chose. But that is the final resting place of Sheriff Johnny Behan. Yeah, the, the 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 main sheriff during the time of Wyatt Earp, uh, the one that was against Wyatt Earp down at the end with the Vendetta ride, Johnny Behan. And you know the crazy thing about that is that tombstone wasn't laid there till over sixty years after Johnny Behan died. So we think of him as this, you know, this unbelievable person in history that that was a part of this unbelievable time in history, and the man had an unmarked grave. For 60 years, most people didn't know where it was buried until this group got together, did this book, went out to hunt, said, hey, it would be great for this book to have Johnny Behan's uh, gravesite on the chapter we talk about him. And they went to the cemetery. They first went to Evergreen, and they went to Evergreen for four days searching for that, went through every single row at Evergreen. I can't believe it only took four days, and there was two people. Then they were told he was buried in the Catholic side, and they couldn't understand why. And then they went to the office and they gave him the plot and the area that his burial was at. It was in the books. And they went there and there was no marker. It was just an empty grave. And around that site, there is empty graves, unfortunately. They rose, they raised the money. A group of uh, people from Tombstone raised the money. And uh, that tombstone was put there over 60 years after Johnny Behan's death, which is just crazy to me. So we think today that this stuff has just been, you know, it was fame. They were famous forever. And they weren't famous forever. They died and were forgotten. And uh, again, because of two major motion pictures, uh, that spot was located and Johnny Behan, the famous sheriff of Cochise County in Tombstone, he got his grave marker. I wish I had a better picture of that. But I don't. I don't. Uh, where else are we going to go? Where else are we going to go? Here we are. Because I was in Florence today, uh, for people who follow me, you might know who this is. Uh, this is in the Florence Cemetery. Um, Thomas J. Sisson. Thomas Sisson um, was a private in the Calvary. Uh, lived from 1869 to 1957. Anybody that watches the show, does anybody want to guess who Tom and Thomas J. Sisson was and what he was involved in uh, when he passed away in 1957? Anybody? I'll wait here for just a minute as I bring up the chat and see if anybody. Uh, yeah, thanks to the wifey. That is true. I thank her for a lot of things. I tell my wife all the time. Uh, things are picking up, uh, speaking engagements and being known a little bit more. And when I do my first big speech, whatever, on Arizona, it's all to the wife because uh, the support for the last five and a half years of me doing this and to have our cheap rap like that when she has to drive around with my face planted all over that thing. Yeah. Yeah, that's... Uh... See here, anybody of Florence? I live 40 miles from there. Scott, do you know who that is? No, please tell, says Brian. Scott, uh, Thomas J. Sisson was involved. We've talked about this before. We won't go in depth on this since we're just flying through famous people. Uh, you live in Kearney, okay. Um, he played for the Cardinals. No, he, um, he was involved in the deadliest shootout in Arizona history. The deadliest shootout in Arizona history. Uh, we talked about this on here. So many people say it happened October 26, 1881, and they couldn't be farther from the truth. Not everything revolves around the shootout at the OK Corral. The bloodiest shootout in Arizona history took place in February of 1918. 1918, where four lawmen uh, were killed, and uh, it's called the Powers Ranch. Look up the power, actually, look up the Powers Cabin, 
and uh, the Power Brothers, and uh, they were involved in the deadliest shootout in 1918 uh, with the brothers. So with the two brothers, the dad, and uh, this gentleman here was a, a hired worker, a friend of the brothers and the dad that was in the cabin that day. And uh, he went to jail from 1918 to 1957, where he actually died while serving a life sentence uh, in prison for the killing of those officers. And there's a lot more to the story. Was he responsible for it or not? It did not matter. He went to jail from 1918 to 1957. He was an older man. He passed away and he was buried in the Florence Cemetery. The other brothers, the other brothers were in their 20s, 23, I believe, and 24 years of age when they went to prison, and they were finally paroled in 1960. They got out when they were like 70 years old. But uh, this uh, this gentleman here is buried there. He was, uh, the prison's, of course, not far from uh, where this uh, cemetery is in Florence. But Thomas J. Sisson involved in the deadliest shootout in Arizona history in 1918. Uh, Yeah. Yeah, Catherine. Uh, it, yeah, we had that long, like where I went everywhere that to about two of these podcasts to go. Uh, that story is crazy. If you think about it, folks, this had to do with the draft with w- during World War One. And uh, they were they were what we would call draft dodgers. But uh, you, you got to realize that there were about 3 million of those in America back in 1918 who did not sign up for the draft. Different time. Uh, there's no television. Uh, there's not a lot of newspapers where these people live. Uh, they had to go into town to figure some things out. And uh, look, it was a misdemeanor if you didn't sign up for the draft. And what was the misdemeanor? It was a heavy fine. Okay, you could pay the fine. And your jail time was not to exceed on a misdemeanor 12 months. Yet, these guys went to jail for the rest of their, I mean, for, for they got life and they served uh, from the time they were 23 uh, to the time they were about 70, these two brothers. And this man, his life was ended in a Florence jail. Uh, it's, a, it, it's a sad, sad, sad story. But uh, he is buried. It took me... You know, that cemetery is not big, but again, it goes back to people, GPS things, and I went to the exact GPS point, and it sucked. It wasn't any, it was 300 to 350 yards off of where they said the burial was. So how did I find it? Again, I found an old picture. I, I There's a few trees there. Tried to line the picture up with the trees and drove down a couple more aisles, and boom, there it was. I would really love to speak with you. Scott, yeah, just hit me up on the email, man. Here, look, this is the email that you can, that you can, uh, let me go to the caption. It's right here. Just hit me up at this email right here. It's one of my emails. Or it's the AZTT at the AZTT.org. All right, let's uh, let's move on. Uh, we're we're late, and uh, we'll see if uh, I got some more here. We've been through about nine of these places now. Uh, let's see where else we got. Hey, you know what? I'm going to throw this one up here. When I was in Ohio, uh, my brother, he, my, some of my, my family live up there. And in this grave site, uh, when I was visiting up there, this huge Lakeview Cemetery up in Cleveland has, it's just massive. And they got some unbelievable people buried. They do actual tours in that cemetery. They're not like the Evergreen Cemetery where they say, you know, keep out. Uh, The one up in Cleveland does. And uh, does anybody recognize, uh, again, we're stepping outside of Arizona, but this is the coolest, uh, the coolest grave site. That is a grave marker, folks. Anybody know whose grave site that could possibly be? And I'll, uh, I'll just put a little bit of music on and wait to see if anybody knows.
Oh, that's exactly what it is, Christine. It's a it's a jukebox. Every anybody here ever heard of Alan Freed? Alan Freed, he coined the phrase. Hey, that was close to Big Bopper, Keith Larkin. Uh, he coined the phrase, folks, rock and roll. Alan Freed had in the fifties the first rock and roll show. Uh, he put together in Cleveland. He was a disc jockey in Cleveland, was one of the earliest uh, in the 1950s disc jockeys for rock and roll. And uh, that's where he's buried. Alan Freed, you can look him up online. But yeah, he, famous disc jockey, put the first rock and roll concert ever together in the 50s and was one of the very first rock and roll DJs. And on the other side, I don't have the picture brought up, but on the other side of this magnificent tombstone, uh, is a picture of him and uh, kind of like his story is on the back of it. But that's just a cool, um, a cool, cool, cool thing that I had in my thing here. There is some, there is some unbelievable, uh, let's see if I have another one in here really quick before I say the name. If I, I don't think I got it. No. Um, uh, right, like I wouldn't say, but 50 yards from him on the other side is the grave of Elliot Ness, the famous Elliot Ness, who was after Al Capone and they got him on tax evasion and all that. But Elliot Ness is, is about if you know, if I was if I was looking at this grave, he's about 55 or 60 yards to the left along a lake. And what they did with Elliot Ness is, um, remains because Elliot Ness and his wife, I believe were both cremated and um, they took their ashes and there's a like right on the other side of his tombstone. uh, I wouldn't say, but uh, 20 yards. If that there's a stream that flows through there and they poured the majority of his ashes into that stream. Uh, And then I think they buried a little bit where the tombstone is at. So most of his ashes again were spread out behind it, but, the uh, famous Elliot Ness, who, again, you know, Kevin Costner is making Wyatt Earp famous in his movie, right? And um, then he's making Elliot Ness famous in the movie. Uh, I forgot the name of the movie. Uh, but, uh, yeah, there's a lot of uh, a lot of famous people. I mean, a lot of famous people buried in this cemetery. You could walk through that cemetery all day and I've come close to seeing all the grave sites that are there. Back over to the chat real quick. All right. Uh, graphics. Let's go to... Man, what have I been talking about? Uh, there's one I want to talk to, folks. I just got to find the uh, the picture here. Um, shoot. Uh, okay, we'll, we'll move on because I thought I had it here. And unless I'm blind, and I am blind, I wear these old man glasses until I get a prescription that I can actually see out of. I just don't see it. Uh, for those of you that weren't around earlier, there's the uh, there's the Johnny Ringo, July 13, 1882, headstone right there in Turkey Creek. Um, there's another kind of famous in there. Anybody know who Daniel Devine is? He's buried in the Catholic cemetery, and I got to think that the the cemetery. That's why I was really wasn't going to bring it up. Uh, he's a pretty famous uh, guy in the sports world. Daniel Devine, really big uh, in in a 1990s movie. That's one of the classics. That's really why I know who he is. So I went to the cemetery looking for his gravesite. Again, he's born in 1924, passed away in 2002 in a Catholic cemetery in Phoenix. He's buried. Uh, Daniel Devine. Let me go back up in here to the chat. Yeah, old old mama glasses is right. Uh, The Untouchables. Yeah, thanks, Brian. That uh, was the movie. Uh, Daniel Devine was the head coach of the Green Bay Packers for a while, but he was the head coach for Notre Dame, for the Notre Dame Fighting Irish. And if you ever saw the movie Rudy, 
That's the Dan Devine that coached Rudy. You know, at that time, Rudy was there. He was coaching Joe Montana also. And uh, Rudy gets to go in and play. And that whole thing is, you know, you know that whole movie is, is unbelievable. I love the movie Rudy. Uh, a lot of it, of course, not true, according to Joe Montana. But anyhow, uh, Daniel De- Devine is buried in Phoenix. And he was the coach, again, of the Green Bay Packers and of the Notre Dame fighting Irish and he won a national championship with Notre Dame and he was uh, portrayed in the movie Rudy. So a pretty cool spot. Let's go back to the caption area here. Man, we went through a lot. I don't know if I have that many more to talk about here. Dodged on that one, that one, that one, that one. Um, Here we got... uh, my second favorite cemetery in the state that we do do tours on, and that is the Globe Cemetery. That And you know what's so great about the Globe Cemetery? It's only a 140-mile round trip, about 70 miles from the house on 60 East. Usually no traffic going up to Globe. And uh, that is the gravesite of Phineas Finn Clanton. Finn Clanton, the famous brother of Ike and Billy Clanton and old man Haynes Clanton, the Clanton gang uh, from Tombstone. Ike is buried in the middle of no man's land. Uh, They think they found his grave site. I've tried to locate it myself and see if it would be worth trekking out there in the Jeep, and I don't think it is. Uh, But this is Finn Clanton was involved in a lot of the vendetta stuff. A lot of people don't realize but he is buried in uh, the Globe Cemetery, Finn Clinton. And uh, it says on his grave, not all good men wear badges. It's a war, actually, I think it says right there. Not all good men wore badges. Pretty interesting that that's on his grave site right there. But uh, that is an interesting grave right next to him. Uh, is an opened spot. I've talked about this before because I did a lot of research on it. There is a guy called Elliot Ferguson, a.k.a. Pete Spence, the famous cowboy uh, from Tombstone, Pete Spence. Pete Spence was the second guy that was going to get taken out um, on the Vendetta ride. So after they were up in Tucson, um they they came back down and they were looking for Pete Spence, but Pete Spence was smart. He went ahead and turned himself in to the local sheriff's office so that uh, that uh, they couldn't get him. But uh, he was the second man to be checked off on the vendetta ride. But uh, Pete Spence is buried and they buried next to him in a grave that looks like it's just in an open space. There's no headstone on it or anything like that. For some reason, if you look at this picture. Across the street, there's a little like little dirt road right there. Across, just down about a spot or two that you can't see outside the frame of this picture, there is a headstone that reads Elliot Ferguson. And on the bottom of it says, AKA Pete Spence. And then it says on the bottom of the stone, approximate location of original site. I do not know why it was moved. Nobody can tell me why it's moved. I've read a number of books on this. Nobody knows why the stone was moved across the road. But uh, he was buried right next to his friend, Finn Clanton. They were in Tombstone together. Pete Spence bought the house right across from White Earp. It still stands out there today. It's like a flower flower store now, though. It's kind of goofy. But um, that is interesting. You know, Pete Spence ends up marrying... Uh, Finn Clanton's wife like a year later. So that was a good buddy. Uh, So that is in the Globe. And we're going to stay in the Globe for, I think, our last one. And that is right here. And Globe has done a good job with other ones. They haven't done it with, like, Finn and some of these other people like Pete Spence, these famous outlaw cowboys. But they do put a lot of markers on a lot of historical ones so you can find it because you can look at the back of that cemetery they're just stacked on top of each other there that is glenn reynolds sheriff glenn reynolds uh the sheriff up there in globe he uh he was in charge of transporting the apache kid and i want to say it's 1889 and um he's heading down with nine apaches uh to go to the yuma penitentiary and uh 
they got him in a wagon and they get as far as Riverside Station where I've been. I found the foundation of the stagecoach stop in Riverside, which is the most remote stagecoach stop in the state of Arizona during the time. And I think it was the most remote ever. And they got them all to there and they stayed the night and then they rounded them up the next morning, put them back in and left. Not far from that stagecoach, they couldn't make it up this steep incline. So they took all nine Apaches out of the wagon. There was one like Mexican rancher or something that, that was in there too. And uh, the, so they sent the horse and, and uh, the stagecoach up the hill. Somehow, some way, the Apaches got the rifle of the two guys that were guarding them. And Glenn ben Reynolds was one. They shot them both dead. And they shot the uh, the guy driving the stagecoach in the neck, but he actually survived and made it back to Riverside Station to tell the story. This is where you're going to start getting the story of the famous Apache kid because he wasn't famous prior to this, folks. Uh, he was actually a pretty good kid. Uh, the famous uh, Indian scout, Al Sieber, who was the sheriff up at the time, went ahead and, and liked this kid a lot, couldn't pronounce his name, so they called him the Apache kid up in Globe and used him for a lot of his work. But he ends up going to the Yuma Penitentiary, ends up escaping. Eight of the other Apaches are caught, okay? They're rounded up and caught. And uh, so is the other gentleman, but he's let out because he helped the other guy get back to safety. And uh, the Apache kid, the story of the Apache kid becomes this famous story, right? It's kind of like Wyatt Earp. Becomes this bigger-than-life story. They never capture him. They don't know how long he lived. They don't know what kind of killing sprees if he went on any of them. They don't know if he lived in Mexico on the border down there or somewhere in Arizona or New Mexico. But uh, I don't know how many books and how many movies have been made about the Apache kid. And it all started with Glenn Reynolds uh, escorting him to the Yuma Penitentiary just past Riverside Station. And that's where he's buried, right? Next to his unfortunate, his infant son or daughter. Maybe his daughter, just months old, uh, right to the right of that grave is the the uh, burial of his daughter. Kind of sad. And then here, oh no, well, 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 well I didn't think that's what I was going to hit. But there is Josephus Phi, in memory of Josephus Phi. One June, eighteen eighty eight. He actually died the thirty first of of May of 1888 anybody anybody know uh, if we stuck around for a minute and i went to the chat who josephus phi was and why he died on the 31st and was buried on the first uh of june 1888 in um florence arizona anybody go over here to the chat Uh, okay, and we'll just we'll just keep it up here. Uh, put this up there. Anyhow, just had to take a quick break there, folks. Uh, Josephus Phi, uh, one of the biggest shootouts in Arizona happened in Florence in uh, May 31st of 1888. And all we hear is about the October 26th, 1881 shootout at the OK Corral. But this shootout in Florence was talked about for just as long uh, throughout Florence in that area for, you know, 10, 15, 20 years. People talk about uh, this shootout because it happened between an ex sheriff, Pete Gabriel, and an ex deputy, Josephus Phi. And they headed out. They shot at each other 12 shots. I mean, you know, a lot of these guys were bad shots back in the day. I'm just going to tell you. And Doc Holliday was one of them. But again, we won't get into that. Um, 
<laughs> if I knew about the test, I would remember. Um, Josephus Phi and Pete Gabriel got into it at the Tunnel Saloon. Unfortunately, that's one of the few buildings in, in Florence that burned down uh, in the 1980s, I believe, or 1970s. Uh, when they put it back up, they put it like in the exact same spot and what it looked like back in the day. But uh, Josephus Phi walked in that May of 1888 and uh, Pete Spence was there. I mean, uh, Pete Gabriel was there, not the singer, but the sheriff. They used to be good friends. They shot at each other 12 times. They were both hit numerous times. And uh, Josephus Phi died that night uh, of wounds. And uh, they said that uh, Pete Gabriel wouldn't live for another 24 hours from the wounds that he had. And guess what? Pete Gabriel, the ex-sheriff, lived another 10 years and went up into the mountains not far from there and mined for 10 years. And he died up there, and he is buried up there. But uh, the burial site really is unknown. They think he died from drinking the water because it was so tainted, the water from doing the mining, that he died from drinking the water up there. But he had a lot of shots in him, and uh, he lived for 10 years while Josephus Phi passed away. So that's the gravesite of Josephus Phi one of the very few grave markers that's in that section of the cemetery. Because what's unique about this cemetery right here is that it is is the oldest part of the cemetery. You can tell right off the bat when you go in there, when you see this, this is closest to the road, this uh, marker. And the reason there's a lot of no, there's a lot of uh, bodies buried there, but no markers is that when they built the second Pinal County courthouse in Florence, the one that looks like, um, uh, that belongs in Colonial Williamsburg uh, in 1890, that was a graveyard. And uh, they put in the newspaper, like they did down in Tucson at the Evergreen Cemetery, that people, if they wanted to move the bodies, they could pay to have the bodies moved and all this stuff. And uh, they moved uh, the bodies to that part of the cemetery And I'm telling you, most of the bodies didn't get moved, just like down by the Evergreen, uh, where the houses are at now. Those bodies weren't moved. And um, so they built the the second Pinal County Courthouse over a graveyard, and it was up and running in 1891. And uh, all those bodies are supposed to be in that section where Josephus Phi is buried. But uh, I'll tell you what, folks. I can guarantee there's a lot of bodies probably underneath that parking lot and underneath that building. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, plus the guns were not that, that accurate. You know, they you know, just we just got a lot of misinformation, folks. Doc Holliday was in a lot of gun uh, battles where even in Tombstone where it's, he's right behind the bar, the guys behind the bar, he's right there and they're shooting point blank at each other and they hit and graze each other in the, uh, in the shoulders. And it takes the butt of a gun to knock out doc holiday, doc holiday really quick. He was, he was known for who he was, this gunfighter because he had tuberculosis. He was given a death sentence uh, when he was in Georgia and then he went to Texas and then he was at Fort Griffin, Texas. He was given a death. He had to get to, he did live a lot longer than expected. His mother died of tuberculosis early uh, in his life. Um, he, he lived a lot longer, I believe, to the age of, what, 37, uh, until he passed away up there in Colorado. Um, but uh, he had nothing to lose. He had nothing to lose. So he would always stand up and and and, and, and use words to come against people. And uh, that's where he gets a lot of his uh, lure, you know, a lot of his, uh, a lot of his history. And it, it's, it's, it, it, uh, it, we're going to, again, we'll go into how many, how many bodies uh, stacked up by Doc Holliday. And I'm telling you what, it's not even close to, to the, what they say it is. It's just his reputation. That's all there is to it. I heard bow and arrows were your best bet back then. That's a possibility. That's a possibility. Um, let's. Uh, so we got Josephus Phi. Let's see if there's anything else in here. Man, I didn't. Again, I wasn't going to stand this long, but everybody's in bed, so I'm not going to get bothered. Uh, we went through that one. 
Went to that one. Um, sorry for all the noise here, folks. Uh, I'm going through each one of these pictures to make sure that we went through all of these grave sites, and I think we have hit every one that I downloaded. That is back there. Yeah, that's Glenn Reynolds. I'm just going to hit it so I can see it. That's Little Robe. Ah, look at this. No, that's Shy Bell uh, that we talked about. Sheriff Shy Bell, Charles Shy Bell, who was the first person to uh, deputize Wyatt Earp in the state of Arizona. This would be a great, this is just a conclusion. Thomas J. Jeffords, the blood brother of Code Cheese. We have the Sheriff Johnny Behan area. We have the Sisson grave site. We have the Johnny Ringo grave site. We have the Ed Shefflin grave site. Uh, we went over to Waylon Jennings grave site. We went over to Pierce Historic Pierce Cemetery, where the great Sergeant George H. Platt, the first bodyguards for the president uh, from the great state of Ohio, is buried. Chief Takalia, who is one of the 100 Apaches who captured Geronimo in 1877. We talked about the great High Jolly uh, Camel Herder. Uh, we talked about the great Arizona Timeless Tours Jeep. We talked about the Warren Baxter Earp. Let's see here. And the gravesite of Jacob Waltz, the lost Dutchman who passed away in 1891, who's buried downtown. We even talked about Charles DeBrill Poston, and he's buried up at Poston Butte, where I do tours every day, Monday through Sunday at 9 a.m. and 1 p.m. They are picking up as the summer gets near. It's kind of crazy, but we're having a great time. I've got nothing but great reviews uh, from everybody that we've done it. There's two separate tours. We do the 90-minute tour where we walk around, and then we do the one with the ruins that costs a little bit more, and we've done them both. Uh, got uh, great reviews from people on both. Um, it was I was glad somebody signed up for that second one. I know it cost more, but uh, it took us about two and a half hours to get through everything. And uh, I always ask at the end of one to ten, and we always get a ten plus in uh, in what the tour actually was. So that is awesome. Uh, again, that's why we gone back to something like that to get more of these tours out there. Oh uh, boy. There's the new logo. Does anyone have any questions? Any other grave sites they want me to go over? That's just a that's just a quick few of the, uh, quick 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 few of these grave sites. I, I've uh, hundreds of these that I can be on all night long with, but um, that is all the ones that I have pictures of. Yeah. I really thought I had the picture of uh, Larcina Pennington Page's gravesite, but I don't. So I'm not even going to go over that one. But her story, look up Larcina Pennington Page sometime. She's buried in the Evergreen Cemetery with her husband and her daughter. Look her up and see her amazing story. Larcina Pennington Page. Uh, let's go over back over to the chat and see if anybody wants anything here. Very cool. Jeep Rap Lofts in Phoenix. Good to see you. Did you ever make it to the Buddy Holly Graves? I did not. You know what? When I spent my short three and a half months in the great, great state of Texas, um, the, the thing was when we were going to leave, we were going to head up that direction. And, and there's two different ways that we could have taken and uh, that was one of the ways that we were going to go. And it added on way too much time. But uh, I wanted, I, it's, it's a place that maybe someday I'll make it again. Uh, but uh, I did not get to make it to, to Lubbock, Texas, and get to see the gravesite of uh, Buddy Holly. I did not see the original Fort Grant. And I'll be honest with you, uh, at Fort Grant, I didn't even think about Fort Grant. Uh, thanks, Joe B. I didn't even think about Fort Grant. Um, you know, for the first time in a long time, the movie uh, Wyatt Earp with Kevin Costner, you know, that's not very famous. I call, if I if I look, if you use the social media platforms for those two movies, Tombstone is your TikTok version. 
and Wyatt Earp is your YouTube version. And, uh, you know, Tombstone just highlights Tombstone. But the Wyatt Earp one, which is not on TV all that much, I sat down for the first time in like seven years and said to myself, I'm going to watch this whole thing. And all this all this uh, studying and, and research that I've done on Tombstone and the Earps and the holidays and all this stuff, I that is the more accurate uh, depiction of Wyatt Earp's life. He, he goes from his first marriage to why his first wife died to his first job to, uh, to, to um, uh, being in Dodge to tracking down people at Fort Griffith to that's where he runs into Doc Holliday. That is a true statement dealing Pharaoh at Fort Griffith. It just it being, uh, you know, taking, you know, uh, getting Buffalo furs and stuff like that. That movie, I was like, wow. You know, when you actually study this and study the history of the Earps and the holiday and all that stuff, Wyatt Earp with the one that Kevin Costner is, is 100%. I'm not saying it's 100% accurate. It's 100% more historical, historically accurate than Tombstone will ever be. So that amazes me. I I was, you know, Tombstone's on every day on, on a station somewhere. And that's all that people talk about. Uh, the problem with Wyatt Earp's version, of, I mean, Kevin Costner's version, it's like Dancing with Wolves. It's like two and a half hours, two hours, 45 minutes. And that's a long time for people to sit and watch. I know things about things about Tombstone you might like to know. And you're probably right. At one point, I thought I heard you say you were moving out to, of Arizona permanently and we're going to rename your channel. Man, you heard that right. That's a good memory. And look, look how this worked. In July, I moved. July 2nd. Well, I was officially in Texas July 7th, all right, of 2021. And uh, we were there for July, August, September, October, to the second, uh, almost the second week of October when I moved back to Gilbert, Arizona. And settled back down here. A few things didn't go right. We were going to run some social media there. We were building a house there in Waco, Texas, because that was the most central part. Uh, some of my videos, I was afraid with, um, I didn't change the channel. And if you go back through my TikTok and look at some of those Texas videos, they did some of the, uh, they performed absolutely unbelievable. Uh that, that graveyard that uh, was at the um, at the cemetery there in Austin, one of the best that there is in the United States. It, it, you went into the history of Texas, you walk through that cemetery. And we did the one on uh, Chris Kyle. I just, I was almost out of there and I'm like, man, I didn't do a quick video on Chris Kyle uh, from the movie American Sniper. And I, and I, I shot the video. And I uploaded the video when I was there. Um, I think it was in August of 2021. And I put it out there. It was 9.8 seconds long. 9.8 seconds long. Just a picture really quick scanned across the gravesite of Chris Kyle. And I went to bed and I got up the next morning to 1.2 million views. And I think right now we're at 8.7 million views on that particular less than 10 second video. Uh, some of the other videos we did from there, it was, Texas, I look, there were some reasons we had to get out and come back, but the history there, <sighs> you could have gone to 10 places a day. Now it took me about 50 hours to get to those 10 places the way Texas is laid out. But uh, it, the history in Texas is like no other state. It really isn't. They, they got more historical markers. I'm looking over there at books. I'm not going to get up right now, but I have two books that are this thick on the other side of this computer. They just list historical markers in the state of Texas. Give you the number, where they're at. And when you're driving, it, you know, it'll say, you know, a mile to your right. And if it's on your left, they make these, they come in and they cut a road across the, the berm there so you can get across and go see the historical marker. Texas, it does probably the best job. I haven't been to all 50 states. I've been to a lot of them. But probably the best job at its history uh, is Texas. Uh, but we spent just a little over three months there in Waco, Texas. And I was from that, we went, we were in, uh, I was up in Fort Worth two or three times. I was in Dallas two or three times. Um, 
I was down in uh, San Antonio once, uh, Austin three or four times, and in between Austin and like uh, say Dallas, numerous times. A uh, lot of TikTok videos done on it. The dinosaur park there, where you see the dinosaur footprints and something rose area. It was absolutely freaking amazing. Uh, saw a lot of great stuff in, in the great state of Texas. I really, I, I enjoyed myself, but I'm very glad to be back where I belong in the great state of Texas. Remember, that's right. Remember the Alamo. Oh, man. I And I, you know, I picked up, I went to a bookstore and when I would got to Texas. And you know how we have the America, we have the Arizona Highways magazines that I got like 20 billion of. Um, they have the Texas Highway magazines. And the first place I went to, they had a few of them on the shelf. They had like four of them, and they were really good. They were like 10 or 12 years old. And I was finding some great stuff, especially around San Antonio. And I said to the guy, do you got any more of these? He's like, man, I got a whole box of them in the back. I mean, there were a couple hundred of them. The box weighed like 50 pounds. And he brought it out, and I'm looking at it. And I said, I really don't want to go through this. I'm like, can I ask you what, what the price would be just to take the box? And he thinks, and I'm thinking, all right, if he goes a buck a piece, like the Arizona ones, you know, it's, it's a couple, there's probably a couple hundred in this thing. He uh, he says $10. So, you know, I'm carrying this 50 pound thing out, and, and I brought most of them back here, but I bought probably about 27 books on the state. I got over a couple hundred of those magazines and uh, I learned a lot of history while I was there and uh, I still study it and I had a great time, but I still got like 5 billion uh, Arizona. Here's a little sneak. Here's a little something that, that you guys might not know that if you want, you know, you have True West magazine written by the great Bob Bose Bell. True West magazine in Cave Creek it was one of the greatest places to go to. I think you can get any one of the magazines since 1959 to present. And um, uh, during the pandemic, they closed the building down, which is a shame. Um, but he was in the process and his staff was in the process of scanning every single True West magazine from 1959 to present. And uh, they finished. And on his website, on the True West website, you can go on there. And I want to say, folks, it's like 40 or 49 bucks for the year. And you can get every single one of those on your phone. At the, the, every single one of True West Magazine since, since the very first issue, I believe, 1959, to the last issue that was just put out this month. Uh, they're scanned. You can just go and search them all on the phone and read them all. It's like $49 for the year. When I go to the bookstores to purchase them, because they're hard to find, it's a it's a dollar fifty to two dollars a piece for these magazines. For forty nine dollars, I got them all at the tip of my hands. I can read any article uh, by Bob Bose Bell and uh, from True West magazine since nineteen fifty nine. It's really an unbelievable offer. Uh, so if you're into True West magazine, I would suggest you go there and and check that out because it's it's a deal of the century. It truly is a deal of the century. Ooh, Brian. Okay, I'm done. Goodbye. I'm sorry, Brian. I did not see that. Thank you, Christine. Uh, so anyhow, if you're in the True West, uh, again, there's no one greater than Bob Bose Bell, and really there's no one greater than him and uh, uh, man, how I forget names because I'm old. Uh, Marshall Trimble. Marshall Trimble, uh, those Trimble, Marshall Trimble and um, Bob Bose Bell, the best historians in the state. Marshall Trimble is actually the official historian of the state of Arizona. He's been given that title by the, the, the legislator here for many years. And the problem here is, is that both of these guys are in their 70s, I think in their, their later 70s. And there's not too many people left. That's why I try my hardest to learn as much as I can, to read as much as I can, to do these things, to be the next guy in line who's not worthy of even being in the same company, but to get the word out. I, I went to a bookstore the other day in downtown Mesa. It was fantastic. 
And there's a guy there about my age. And we were talking. He's like, I've never met anybody who knows as much about Arizona as you do. And that was kind of nice because this guy was just full of information. So, you know, I learn a lot from them. And then I try to get it out to you guys. So uh, are you working on your channel full time or do you have balance, balance it with a career? I have a full time job and work on my channel part time. 59K subscribers so far in a year and a half. Are you on YouTube, Lost in Phoenix? Uh, yeah, this is all I do. Uh, I have a phenomenal wife. I'm in 100% for the next 12 months on, on, on this thing. I've been doing it for about five years. Um, we are mostly updated on, uh, on, on TikTok. Seems like you invest tons of time on your channel. Great job. Hopefully it blows up soon. Yeah, the YouTube one will never blow up. I give up on YouTube. I don't post on YouTube. You'll see these get uploaded to YouTube. We do a couple of shorts on YouTube. And what's funny is my the TikTok is where I put all my energy in for a year and a half. Uh, there's nowhere else I'm going to get 169,000 views and over 70 million. I mean, 70 million total views, 169,000 as of today uh, followers and all of the uh, endorsements and product endorsements and and things. If you want to follow me on Newsbreak, folks, they've come to me. We are now on Newsbreak. I know that's on all the Apple phones, but uh, they came to me. We we signed a contract with Newsbreak, so all of our videos are out there doing great. Uh, it's it's financially been one of the best things I've ever been on, other than TikTok. But uh, YouTube is just a place to store old videos and to do stuff like this. Uh, I'm giving up on that channel, but uh, thank you. Uh, I'll check you out though when when this is over and see uh, see what you got on there at Lost in Phoenix if that's the uh, the name of your channel. Okay, folks. Well, thank you. Uh, it's eleven forty in the evening. Eleven twelve one two. That means two forty on the East Coast and one forty Central Time. So I appreciate everybody uh, hanging on. It's been over like a month and a half since we've done this, so it's been great to see everybody. Thanks for everybody in the chat. Again, anybody can get a hold of me at dnb7010 at gmail.com to ask a question or to schedule a tour. And the tours are going great. So thanks to everybody who scheduled those tours. Yeah, I don't think Brian understands that the best of the best Americans died at the Alamo. Davy Crockett, the creator of the Bowie Knife. Yes, yes. Alamo. I made it there. I was there. My hotel was right next to the historic... Uh... Dang it, Dean. It's, I'm out of Texas. and The only reason I'm doing this is because I know I got the book. There it is. Mm, boom. The Manger Hotel. So the Manger Hotel is right next to the Alamo. Uh, so it's that old hotel. It's where Teddy Roosevelt which I love so much is where Teddy Roosevelt uh, went to um, to uh, assemble the the Rough Riders in, in that bar there. And they have these logs in there from all these people, all these famous people that stayed at the Manger Hotel. And I stayed right next to the Manger Hotel. So at night I was I was 60 yards. So I step outside. I'm at the Manger Hotel. And just on the other side of the Manger Hotel is the Alamo. And uh I would go out there like at 10, 11 o'clock at night because the park ranger has to stay there. It's open 24 hours and uh, we would have great discussions because nobody was out there and you're just sitting in front of the Alamo all lit up. It was, uh, it was the first time ever I've been there boot camp and some other t one other time, but never got to go in the Alamo. And I took the one where you put the headset on and uh, I, I got there really at the last second. I wanted to get there in the first tour and there's like 25 people in it and they cut it off at that and, they're like, well, I still want that one. They're like, well, it's kind of expensive. And I'm like, well, how much could it possibly cost? I think it was 40 bucks. I'm like, well, that's uh, here's 40 bucks. And give you the headphones. And the guy walked around and he talked and he talked into something and it went into the headphones. So, you, you know, if you were farther away in the crowd and went inside the Alamo and then you can get behind when the most of the people, when you just go into the Alamo, when you pay, you can go into the back rooms and stuff of the Alamo. Uh, that was awesome. That was absolutely awesome. I had a great time. Spent five days there. Five nights. It was, van it was fantastic, Christine. Catherine 
Good night and thanks. Uh, love your live chats, Brian. Thank you. Um, anyhow, yeah, Alamo, absolutely. The, the cenotaph there to those people who died at the Alamo is unbelievable. Um, I did not get down to the other grave site. Uh, I got to the cathedral that supposedly uh, has the um, James Bowie, uh, Davy Crockett, and uh, the other gentleman that uh, I, I should remember. But uh, it's it's in the hallway there. It's in a little coffin. Those were supposed to be the bones of them. I don't know how they could know this, but uh, it was a pretty awesome experience to go and check that place out. Wow, Hearst Castle cost $30 out here. Hearst Castle. I'll have to look that up. And really quick, when I was in uh, Sam Houston. No. Yeah, 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 Sam Houston. Um, When I was, uh, let me think, uh, let me think. Uh, I was just When I was in Florence today, uh, there was a shop uh, that just opened up in an old building built in the late 1800s, early 1900s. And uh, when I was in there, it was like a secondhand shop. And then they're going to put this huge candy store in it. And there are fourth generation people who lived in Florence. So I talked them up, gave them a chip, told them who I was. And uh, he, she says to um, her brother, hey, man, take them downstairs. And uh, it was weird. Uh, I went downstairs. I don't know these people. But I'm not going to say no. There's tunnels underneath. And I've always wanted to get down into these tunnels of Florence. And we go down there and it's just pitch black. And he's turning these lights on. And I'm like, mm. I'm all, all my senses are on high. I'm like, oh, I can see me. Something bad happened in here. And we go down. The nicest guy in the world. These people were fantastic. It was just weird. And we go down this tunnel. And this it's like a huge basement now. Because they've they've it's so huge that they made rooms in the like 1930s and 1940s. But during uh, Prohibition, it used to be a secret spot down there, and they used to play shuffleboard. And I'm like, well, how do you know they played shuffleboard down here? And they have all these like written stories of them sneaking down there in the 1930s and playing shuffleboard and drinking and stuff like that. And very faintly, on the floor uh, that they cleared off, because it was like had like four inches of, of debris on top of it, they didn't realize there was a concrete underneath it. And it has two faint shuffleboard things on there. So that was, so we were down there. That was cool. Uh, they had the original uh, river rock from the Gila River that they built the walls of down in the, uh, I call it a basement, but it is a tunnel. It's a large tunnel. But it was cool. It was worth going to Florence today uh, to get down there. I've never, never gotten the opportunity. And I can't believe they they said go ahead because a lot of people, insurance reasons, they get scared to let people down into places that aren't like approved by the city. Cause even said, watch your step and just know that these are. And I'm like, don't worry. I take full responsibility uh, for walking down here and getting in here. It was pretty awesome, though. Pretty awesome piece of history in Florence. And California is amazing. Check it out. I will. Catherine, I will, I will check that out. All right, folks. Thank you. Let's not uh let's not take this thing too far. Uh, again, now we're at 1147. To go to bed, I get up early and take my daughter to a train station at uh, three two o'clock in the morning on uh, Monday morning. So trying to get my sleep different here in the next couple of days. So I'm going to crank up the music, maybe crank up a video, uh, but I thank everybody. Again, if anyone ever has any questions, hit me up at my email here. I'll put it up on the thing here. Just hit me up in an email. You want to schedule a tour. You want to schedule talking. You want to got people coming in from out of town. You just want to talk. There it is, DMP7010 at gmail.com. Thank you.